All right. Um, I think this is advertised as just being about measuring uh, niche overlap in geographic space, but we're going to be a little bit broader than that, and we're going to talk about measuring niche breadth in geographic space as well. All right, so back out a bit here. Often we've got these biological questions where we've got uh, the distribution of one species and the distribution of another species, and we're wanting to use that data to make some inference about, uh, for instance, the relative breadth of their environmental niches or the overlap between them or, or things like that. And that's cool and it's reasonable, a lot of interesting questions there, but it's actually a fundamentally weird thing to do because we're taking this data, we're making some sort of correlative model, then we're projecting that model across thousands, millions of grid cells to get relative suitability in all these different places, and then we're taking either a single model or a comparison between two models across all those grid cells, and we're condensing that comparison down to a single number. Uh, in this case, we'll talk about Levin's niche breadth. So we're going from point data to a map with all the assumptions that makes, and then we're going from a map or a pair of maps down to a single number. And every step along that way, uh, uh, we're either sort of injecting biases or noise or whatever, or in the case of these metrics, we're often throwing away a lot of information. So don't get me wrong, these metrics are extremely useful. Uh, uh, obviously, I use them all the time. But when we go from comparing a couple of maps to having a single number, there are assumptions uh, uh, there are bits of information that are discarded or obfuscated, and it's really worth thinking about these things in that context. So I'm not going to drill too much into uh, uh, the actual arithmetic of how these things are calculated. I'm mainly going to talk about the things you need to think about when you're applying these metrics to a biological question. Okay, so uh, niche breadth. This is uh, based on metrics from uh, Levens from, from, I think, 1968, if I remember correctly. Um, there's other metrics of niche breadth that could also be applied to species distribution models. Um, I think a lot of these metrics come out to be very highly correlated, so I don't know how, how worth it is to kind of get down to the fine details of which metrics better than which, but um, yeah. Basically, what these niche breadth metrics do is they essentially just measure the flatness of a probability distribution or a frequency distribution. So these were originally developed in the context of these sort of resource utilization histograms where you've got these kind of discrete resources. These could be, you know, initially they would be, you know, trees and bushes and fences or, or whatever you've got. And you basically just calculate how often you see a species you're interested in in each of those resource bins. And then Levin's niche breadth metrics are just essentially ways of saying how flat, how uniform is this distribution of frequencies. So this is a species that's occurring in every one of those uh, resource bins at equal frequency, and so it would have a very broad niche breadth, a very high uh, value for that metric. This is a species that's mainly occurring in one of those resource bins, and so it would have a very low niche breadth. It's primarily just occurring in one resource and leaving the other ones relatively empty. So essentially what we're doing when we're applying this metric to a, a niche model is we're actually just taking this as is, and we're treating the distribution of suitability scores as effectively a two-dimensional histogram. So to go back to my model selection talk, when we do that, we're actually assuming that the suitability scores in the, uh, each of these grid cells are or are proportional to the probability of observing your species here or the relative frequency at which you'd observe your species here. So that's a pretty big assumption that this can be treated as a probability distribution, and we have to be aware of that assumption. But now making that assumption, we essentially just go grid cell by grid cell here and calculate the niche breadth metrics just as we would for a resource utilization histogram. And that allows us to get uh, uh, from a niche model a single value that tells us essentially how broad or how narrow the distribution of suitable habitat for that species is. And that's very cool, but there are some nuances into how you should think about what that means, right? because this isn't the breadth of a species niche or niche model in environment space. This isn't saying how broad is the set of environments it could tolerate in any absolute sense. 
nor is it saying what proportion of the available habitat is actually suitable for the species. What this is, is a measure of the flatness of the distribution of suitability scores across a given study region. So uh, uh, that is a quite a different thing from saying how broad is the species environmental tolerance. It's effectively saying how selective would the species be in a given environmental context. And by that I mean a, a given suite of available environments. How selective would a species be? And that's an important thing to think about. And we're going to talk about this again with overlaps. But this niche estimate, it's filtered through the set of available environments. This is your model intersected with the available habitat that you measure niche breadth across. And that can drastically affect the measures of niche breadth you get. So let's take this example here where I've got this little square model. We can call this a bioclim model if you want to. And we've got the same model for the same species. But now this dashed line here represents the environmental uh, uh, context, so the suite of available environments that we project a model over. So let's say this is the available environments in its home range, and this is, let's say, at, you know, in, in some introduced range. So when we project this model across this set of available environments, most of those available environments are suitable for the species. So we would probably get a high uh, estimate of niche breadth using our niche breadth metrics. If we actually transfer this to a new environment though, now this new environment has a lot of combinations of environmental variables that our model doesn't think are suitable for our species. So that's everything over here. And that means the, the, niche, the niche breadth we calculate for this model will be quite a bit lower in this context than it is in this context. And that is often a very useful thing to measure. I, I, I don't want to make this sound like this isn't a useful measurement, but it does need to be thought of in the context of the available environments. Uh, for instance, just as a hypothetical, if a species was actually very specialized in a specific combination of environments, but that combination of environments was extremely common in the study region, it would come out as having a very high niche breadth because even though its uh, it, its niche is narrow, it's actually it's a it's it's able to live almost everywhere across the landscape, right? So this is a, a, a kind of a, a interesting nuance, but a really useful thing thing to think about. Just to revisit, this is a measure of the flatness of the distribution of suitability scores in a given set of available environments. Okay, so that's niche breadth. Um, now we're going to jump over to uh, overlap. And so this is a pretty similar in the way it's calculated, but this is uh, overlap is really used for measuring similarities between species or sometimes between models for other reasons. So overlap, once again, this is uh, uh, often calculated using metrics that are taken directly from the sort of classic ecological literature. Um, one of the most popular metrics is, is Shaner's D. And um, this again was from 1968, weird coincidence, but also uh, was initially intended for comparing resource utilization histograms. So we've got these you know, five discrete resources here, and we've got two species, and we basically go bin by bin, and we ask how similar are the frequencies for these species in these two bins, and in these two bins, and these two bins, and these two bins. And we have this metric D, which is essentially just a way of going across all those bins and just kind of summing up the levels of, of, of difference you see between those two species. And it goes from zero, where they're using entirely non-overlapping resources, to one, where they're using the same resources at the same frequency. And so again, the extension to, to niche models is pretty straightforward. We actually just treat these suitability scores as a two-dimensional histogram of relative frequency or probability. And then we go grid cell by grid cell, and we calculate the difference in suitability scores between these two species. And then we have the way of sort of summing them up into this summary metric that just sort of characterizes overall how similar are the geographic distributions of suitability scores for these two species. It's very straightforward, and it's quite useful in hypothesis testing. It is, again, worth thinking about what this isn't. This is a measure of the overlap uh, or the similarity in geographic distributions of estimated habitat suitabilities for two species. 
This isn't overlap in environment space. This is not the same thing as saying their fundamental niches overlap by this much. It's essentially that fundamental niche filtered through the suite of available, available environments to the extent that you think the model estimates the fundamental niche. Right? And so it's, it's really kind of possibly more about species ability to interact within a given distrib a distribution of available environments than it is about the fundamental niche. And that thing about the availability of habitat in the study area, that's actually really important. I mean, it was with breadth, but it's just as much so with overlap. Because you take, for instance, we get a blue model here and a green model. We'll call these two species. Well, let's say they overlap. They, they, they both these models being somewhat different. Here they say uh, uh, these species are both really like this combination of environments. Well, it happens the combination of environments those models say that both species like are really common in the available environments, this dashed line here, right? So basically, these models, they agree that both species really like this set of environmental conditions, and that set of environmental conditions happens to be really common. And so you calculate a really high niche overlap for these species here. However, you could take those same two niche models, right, but you change the available environments, and now you get this model is saying, you know, the blue species likes these conditions, the green species like these conditions, but the only conditions that both the blue and the green species are said to like by these models is right here in this one little corner. So in this case, even though the models haven't changed, here you calculate a really high niche overlap, and here you calculate a really low niche overlap. So it's really worth thinking about these metrics in this context. They are meaningful within a given environmental context, and they may change completely when the environmental context changes. It's about species' abilities or projected abilities to interact given a, 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 a specified set of environmental conditions. I do want to just really quick address an alternative to these niche overlap metrics that we've put into e &M tools. Um, you can also just easily hand roll your, this yourself in, uh, in R if you want to, um, which is Spearman rank correlation. You can also use uh, uh, Pearson, but I like Spearman because it's, you know, uh, uh, doesn't assume, it doesn't necessarily require that things be linear or anything like that. So, Spearman rank correlation, this is just a good old fashioned non parametric measure of correlation between uh, 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 two things. Um, and it might be, I think, in some cases more appropriate than our ecological overlap metrics, given our questions and given our data. Not always, um, but I think it's a useful alternative. I'm going to show you why I think it's really interesting here. So let's take two species that have the exact same response to an environmental gradient. And you can't see the pink one here because it's hiding right behind the blue one. But yeah, the uh, D and I values here, so traditional overlap values would be one. And so would Spearman rank correlation because these two are perfectly correlated. So that's fine. But now let's take a case where one species has exactly the opposite response to an environmental gradient from another species. So Spearman rank correlation, because these thing, two things are exactly negatively correlated, Spearman rank correlation is going to give you a negative correlation here, right? It's going to say, no, these are doing exactly the opposite things. But when you look at D and I, they're actually both still telling you you've got a reasonably high amount of overlap. And that's because there is this middle domain here where the habitat is predicted to be somewhat suitable for both species. So you've got a decent chunk of overlap because these both species could potentially live under this set of conditions. And that neither of these metrics are wrong. They're just telling you different things. Uh, these uh, uh, sort of overlap metrics are essentially telling you these species have the, the, the potential to co-occur uh, if, you know, habitat is suitable above, you know, a certain threshold. And this one is talking more about the species responses, the response and suitability to a set of environmental gradients, right? So if you, if your question was more fundamental niche E, arguably rho is more relevant. But if your question is more about species potential to interact or to compete, uh, um, uh, then, then these uh, overlap metrics might be more relevant. Going uh, uh, sort of to the middle extreme if that's a thing. What if we have data that's completely uncorrelated? We just have random numbers. 
D and I actually still give you pretty reasonably high measures of overlap because just by chance, you get some distributions of suitabilities here or some estimated suitabilities here where both species get a similar uh, uh, um, ranking, right? Or a, a similar uh, suitability value. Whereas Spearman rank correlation will tell you these two uh, response cur uh, curves are completely uncorrelated with each other. So I think there's a lot of um, situations in which this sort of rank correlation is actually doing a better job of telling me at least what I'm usually interested in than do those uh, 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 typical overlap metrics. So to, to sum that up, overlaps are offering, I think, a more appropriate metric for measuring shared suitable habitat within a specific geographic space. But if you want to look at geographic space and say the response to environmental gradients are similar or different, uh, the correlation metrics may actually be more appropriate. And again, those are implemented in E&M tools, but it's just standard Spearman rank correlation. You can do it easily in R. One thing that people, I think, don't think about or talk about enough when it comes to the overlap metrics is standardization. So remember, we wanted, uh, we were actually sort of using our, our little uh, uh, suitability scores as estimates of probability or frequency. If we want to treat those things as probability distributions, and we have to in order for those metrics to work, we have to standardize the suitability scores for a model so that they sum to one across the study area, right? So it's just a requirement. Uh, otherwise, those metrics run away and get very strange. But that requires us to do something very strange. So let's take these two models. So this is an environmental gradient, and this is a model for one species, how it responds to the environment. This is a model for a number, uh, another species. It's actually very identical in shape, um, but this species has a higher prevalence, so it's more probable um, uh, under every set of environmental conditions than this one is. So this is a common species. This is a rare species. They actually respond the same uh, relatively to the same set of environmental gradients. In order to turn these things into uh, uh, probabilities that we can use in our metrics, both of these distributions have to sum to one, which means we've essentially got to add all this up and divide by it so this sums to one, same here, and that is going to bring this distribution down and possibly bring this distribution up, right? Which makes them the same, even though one has a much higher prevalence than the other one does. So that's a really crucial thing to, to, to recognize when it comes to these metrics of breadth and overlap. They essentially flatten out any signal of prevalence. So if two species respond, or if two species models respond to a set of environmental gradients the same way, you will get 100% niche overlap for them, even if one is really common and the other is really rare. So it's really worth considering that that is essentially being removed from your comparison by the way those metrics are calculated. And if you really need prevalence to uh, uh, be a factor when you're comparing your species, uh, you might want to think about different ways of making those comparisons. All right, so that was just a brief conceptual overview of the sorts of ways these things are calculated, and also I think the, the things you need to keep in mind when you're using these to, to, to estimate uh, biological processes and patterns. All right, and thank you very much.